Hey there! I'm Sarah A. Crispin, the author of The Tales of Chetsamoka, and today I'm going to tell you about the sort of hats that the ladies in Chetsamoka would have been wearing in the 1880s and 90s. A lot of the characters in the Tales of Chetsamoka are members of the same cycling club. I want to start out with a cycling cap today. And incidentally, Gabriel is selling cycling caps just like this one. So you can find them on his website, www.victoriancycles.com, if you want one like this just for yourself, or for your boyfriend or girlfriend, because that brings me to the history of these. So. What a woman would wear cycling depended in part on her goals for cycling for the day. If she was going for a ride just to ride around the park and be seen, she would probably be dressed quite fashionably. And she might be wearing a hat not unlike this one. In fact, on the cover of Love Will Find a Wheel, there is a picture from a cyclist's magazine, or cyclist book, from 1883, and the lady in the picture is wearing a hat very similar to this one in 1883, even though this particular hat is from about 1910. And so, low speeds, nice and slow, trying to catch the eye of a handsome young man. She would be dressed up quite nicely. But if she's going for distance or for a long journey, this would probably not be her choice. There were ladies who took their tricycles over the Alps on routes that aren't even passable by cars in the modern era, and I don't think they were wearing these. So another popular option for cycling and this was a pretty romantic one too. The ladies would often borrow the men's caps, especially if they were in a club together. There's a scene in Delivery Delayed where little Sophie sees Addie's cycling uniform for the first time and she starts giggling and tells Addie, you're wearing a man's hat. And Addie explains to her that that's because the women modeled their uniforms in part on what the men were wearing. It's a club. They want to complement each other. They want to coordinate. Now the women are still wearing skirts with their uniforms, but it's a much more masculine look overall. And the reason for that is that a lot of sportswear had military influences on it. The history of sportswear is really interesting. When it started to become fashionable to work out and get sweaty, people started asking themselves, okay, how can we work out and get sweaty and not lose status? What are we going to wear? And so looking into, because up until that point, really, working out and getting sweaty was something that the poor laboring class would do. It's not something upper class people would do for fun until sports got popular. And when looking into ways that upper class people could exert themselves physically and not look like poor laborers, they said, okay, there are two contexts which are familiar to us as upper class people. There's the military, for obvious reasons, military people have to do physical endeavors. So they, for sportswear, they borrowed a lot of military influences. And the other context, which is almost, I mean, that's pretty much the opposite end of the scale. They also realized, okay, the other context in which an upper class individual is 
energetically exerting themselves is when they're children. Because you can't stop a child from running and jumping. And so they borrowed certain elements of kids' clothing for sportswear as well. That's why the women have the short skirts. If you've seen videos of me in my cycling outfit that I wear on my tricycle and my bicycle, the skirt goes to about mid-calf. And if that was in any context other than sports, that would be about the skirt length for a 12-year-old girl. But grown women were wearing them that length for cycling. And it was because it was the, the sportswear, the context that they borrowed from kids stuff. And similarly, the men were wearing knickers, which again, if it was any context other than sports, knickers would be left off at about age 12 for a boy. So fun little things. But back to the cycling caps. So someone in a cycling club would have a cap like this. And also, when <laughs> a lot of women would take up cycling because a man in their life was already a cyclist, and it this was all, it started a lot of the time with a husband who was a cyclist and got his wife into the sport, and then younger and younger women got involved, and so they would see these cycling clubs as a sort of dating opportunity. And it was a very coquettish thing to say, oh, could I borrow your jacket or could I borrow your cap? Something like that. And the history of why these caps look the particular way they do is pretty involved and kind of interesting. I'm just going to give you a quick, quick version. Basically, if you think uh, this, again, it's from military styles. So if you think of a Civil War kepi, the little caps they had in the 1860s, that kind of got taken in by the sports people. It evolved a bit, and it changed into, it sort of branched out in this hat evolution tree. And so one of the little branches of the, the evolutionary tree of the cap became the baseball cap, and then the cycling cap is another branch of the tree, but they all started out as the Civil War Kepi. And before I leave the topic of civilian fashions that were influenced by branches of the military, I should tell you a little bit about boaters. Now, if you have a friend in the Navy or someone who's really into military history, they can tell you far, far more about the history of this hat than I ever could but I'll do my best. So Senate hats made of straw were an item of clothing for sailors for a long, long time. And then in the 19th century, they started getting picked up by civilians. They might have been picked up by civilians before then in some context, but they definitely were in the 19th century. Um, in the 1860s, a lot of women and children were wearing sailors hats and by the 1880s, a lot of civilian men were wearing hats that were inspired by sailors' hats. And that is the boater. These became absolutely de rigueur for sports by the 1890s. They, again, they were popular even before that. And I really love the photograph I've got of Jacob and Addie that inspired their characters because they have both got little straw hats. And it shows you that was another unisex item of clothing. By the early 20th century, this shows up in a lot of the artwork of Charles Dana Gibson. If you're familiar with the Gibson girl, who is this wonderful, vivacious lady in artwork, in when she's golfing or playing tennis, she's very often wearing a boater. And these were just really popular, both for men and women. And I recently was absolutely incensed when I got my latest copy of the Victorian Trading Company catalog. And they, in their description of the boaters that they're selling from that company, they, they claim that Coco Chanel started it. And it goes back rather a lot longer than 
her. Her grandmother probably had one, and even then, it wasn't new. So, those are sports hats. Those are hats that saw a lot of active wear. And another hat that saw a lot of active wear, but in a very different way, is the sunbonnet. Now, virtually every American woman would have had one of these in her closet. A farm wife would have had it for working in the fields or taking care of the animals. A woman like Mrs. Fuller in the stories, who is a cook at a logging camp, would have had it for going to and from the camp and going on errands in town. A middle class woman like Addie would have had it for working in her garden. Or again, casual errands, things she's not going to dress up real fancy for. Even an upper class woman like Ethel in the stories is going to have it for situations where she doesn't want to get dolled up to the nines. Ethel's a scientist, so she would have one of these for doing expeditions, going out and collecting specimens in the woods. There was a bit of variation between sunbonnets. But some of the basic features, it has a brim to keep the sun off your face, and many of them would have a snood as well. Now this is a cloth snood to keep the sun off my neck, there was another item called a snood, which was more fashionable, that was more of a hairnet for keeping the hair in place. If you've read Little Women, Joe had one of those, but this is a very functional snood. And an interesting thing about this particular one, they've fallen out of fashion in America, but I actually bought this in Japan <laughs> back in 2007 when I lived there because the women there still wear these, working in the rice paddies. So it's an interesting cultural thing that it's gone a little bit away from our culture, but they still have it there. Now, I use this for berry picking because I keep my hair in a bun, but berries, the, the best berries by the trail tend to get eaten really quickly. So to look for berries that are still there, I have to go off trail quite a bit, and that means going through a lot of thorns and sticks. Now thorns and sticks in hair is not very comfortable, as anyone with long hair can tell you. They tend to, the sticks tend to get caught and then they pull my hair, which is not good. So the nice thing about wearing this is that the sticks just kind of, they kind of brush off. There's no individual strands like there is with hair, so they just kind of slide over. Now, one of the fun things I've noticed with this hat is that hummingbirds love this format of hat because to them it looks like a great big trumpet flower or a morning glory, which is their bread and butter. Hummingbirds love trumpet-shaped blossoms. So they will see me and be asking themselves if this is the single biggest food source they have ever seen. And they'll hover there in front of, right in front of my eyes, trying to work out whether I'm a flower or a lady. And so I get to get some really up close and personal encounters with hummingbirds, which are really, really fun. You might have, if you've read my nonfiction book, This Victorian Life, you might have seen a picture of me just sort of staring up into the sky and I look kind of silly because I look like I'm just staring into the sky. I'm actually watching a hummingbird. I was picking berries. And I told you that hummingbirds love the format of this hat. I should point out that there were, so this is a very much a working hat. There were fashionable hats that had a similar form. They have a similar shape. But these were much earlier, so these are 1860s style hats. And by the time the Tales of Chetsamoka take place, these were out of fashion. So I'm not going to focus too much on those. This hasn't by any means been an exhaustive list of all the hats that were available for active women in the 19th century. But I hope it's given you some points of discussion for dispelling any notions your friends might have about hats being strictly formal wear. Hats were just part of being dressed to go outside in the Victorian era, and there were as many different hats available as there were different activities and different people doing them.